really believe that God has a word for you this morning. Now, I've known that I was going to speak today. You know, we, we schedule ahead. I knew this was coming. And I thought I had an idea what I was going to be bringing to you. But then life happens. Right? And God changed because it's the same story. I've been in this particular story in the Bible. Really, I've been in the story in the Bible like for about a year trying to prepare this because he's been speaking to me in so many areas and I think I need to share this and every time I'm going to share God changes it so I'm going to speak of that story now you want to know well you're going to have to pay attention I'm going to tell you in a minute see I'm building excitement is it working all right so um but I I'm going to speak to you from that story but it is amazing how when we read God's word everything changes for us even the stuff that you think that you know you read it again because the Bible will read you. If you allow it, it will read you. And it is, and I know, and I've said it before, but every time it happens, I'm surprised. Isn't that funny? I, like, I'm 52 years old. And every time it happens, it happens all the time. But every time it happens, I'm surprised. Like, oh, look at God. Like, I'm totally shocked. But every time I read a story, it speaks to me exactly where I'm walking through. And one thing I've learned and I debated because I'm one, and if you are a regular attender and normal here at Free Life Chapel, you know that, um, that I like to talk about the stories after they're done. You know what I mean? Because I think while I'm going through it, you know, there's a lot going on. And I am not a good, I used to be an incredible pretender, like a faker. And now that I'm not, it's like I can't fake it. You know, that's so weird because I used to be so good at it. You know, and now it's tragic. I cannot do it. Like, you see, like, if I'm happy, you know it. If I'm upset, you will know it. You know what I'm saying? I can't, I can't shake it. So, but I really feel like God is asking me to share with you how he has encouraged me in this particular season of my life. Is that okay if I do that? So, I know I'm not going to give you something like, you know, like you've never heard before, but I'm here to stir up your cheese. I need you to look to your neighbor and say, stir up your cheese. I see you. You're reluctant. It's not dirty. People, we're in church. I need you to say it with conviction. Stir up your cheese. I love Mexican food. Anybody else love Mexican food? Okay, Pastor Scott doesn't love Mexican food, but he gets to eat a lot of Mexican food because he loves me. So be happy for him. So I love white cheese. I love the white cheese. I don't like the yellow cheese. Nothing wrong with yellow cheese. I like the white cheese. I have this thing for white things. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm consistent. <laughs> so when we go to a Mexican restaurant and I ask, is your cheese, your queso, is it white, is it yellow? Because I ask, you know. So it's why they bring the cheese, and I tell them, I said, I want it really, really hot. And I tell them ahead, I'm very sweet about it. I, I want it really hot, like super hot. I'm a little weird. I want it really, really hot. So they bring it, and it's hot. I need to see the steam. You know what I'm saying? I need to see it. It needs to be like, shh. It would be awesome if I could hear it. They don't do it for me because then they think I'm going to sue them. So, and I understand. So they bring, the, and then Scott, they bring the cheese and the chips and the salsa and we're eating and then we get to talking and then I start looking at the cheese and I don't want to touch the cheese and Scott is like, Cindy, still good. I'm like, can you send it back? And he's like, Cindy, it's still good. He knows exactly. Like I start looking at him like, will you please? <laughs> he's like, Cindy, it's still good. I said, no, but it's crusty. Because we've been talking and it gets like that crusty. It's like it's not hot anymore. If, and if I'm going to do the damage, people, I'm going to enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? So he's like, Cindy. So he just looks at me with a little bit of the rolling of the eyes, but in a sweet way. So I don't mind it. So he gets a chip, and the moment the chip touches the, the cheese, he stirs it, and the steam reappears. He, it all, he, Cindy, you just need to stir it up. How many times am I going to tell you? And, and again, every time we go, he has to tell me. It's like, I don't, I'm consistent, I told you. So when he stirs up, it's like the steam comes up, and the cheese is still gooey and good. So I am here to stir up the cheese. I am here to stir up the word that is on the inside of you. 
Is that okay? All right, so many of you know that me and my family, or my family and I, that's better grammar, we are going through a storm in our life. We're going through, through a season in our life that is probably not our favorite. There will be a day that I will stand here and it will be like, oh my God, it was marvelous, it was great, really it wasn't so bad. But today is a little bit of a storm. And I pray that when the storm passes, I remember how it was, you know, because I, I never appreciate when people go through something and they're like, yeah, it was nothing. It was nothing. You're about to go crazy. You were like walking around crazy person. You know what I'm saying? Let's remember things like the word. Let's give glory to God, but let's not minimize it. You know what I mean? Don't make it more than what it is, but let's not minimize it. So we're going through something right now, but this storm, I'm kind of walking confident in it. It's not an awesome storm. It's like a, I don't know that there's an awesome storm. You know what I'm saying? A storm is, is strong and forceful and the winds and the waves are big and they, they come at you and it's dark. Even if it's in the middle of the night, it gets dark and you can't see straight and it's not like a nice spring shower. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about a storm. My mom has been sick for quite some time and after many tests and doctor's reports, my mom has been diagnosed with lymphoma cancer. I know, but don't worry because you know that name that we were just talking about, the name of Jesus, come on. Oh yeah, even cancer has to bow down to that name. So my mom has been diagnosed with lymphoma cancer and, and yeah, there she is, that's my mama, Doris. And God has opened up in the middle of the storm. Now, that's not awesome news. But in the middle of the storm, we have seen the hand of God open doors and favor in getting into the right door with the lymphoma specialist at Muffet where they said it would take months. Hello, she starts chemotherapy on Tuesday. Come on, somebody. Yes. Listen, I would love it if God will move the mountain. I would love it. If God will move the mountain and, and the mountain be removed. And God does that. He has done that for us. And he could do it. He is willing. He is able. But for this particular time, he, that's not the way he's working in our lives. He's like, okay, girl, you're going you're gonna to sweat. It's like, I don't like to sweat. <laughs> he's like, no, girl, it's time for you to exercise some. You have been equipped. You are prepared. We have a fabulous guide in Holy Spirit. We're going hiking. We're going to hike this mountain. And for what I hear, the top, uh, the view at the top is amazing. I'll tell you all about it when we get there. But for now, we're hiking. And we're going to be okay. I am confident through the storm. I am confident because I am confident in my relationship with Christ. I, my mom is confident in her relationship with God. We're not trying to figure it out. We are in covenant. We are living under the hand, the, bless, under the hand of blessing of God. We don't have to figure out, make sure, are we okay? No, we are good with God. Now, we're not perfect. Don't misunderstand. We're not perfect. We just know, we know who our God is. Psalms 91, 15, I want them to put that, that scripture there. Because I want to make sure that you don't think that we're going confident because we think we deserve it, because we don't. I don't want you to think that we're walking confident through the storm because we can earn God's blessing, because we can't. We're walking confident because my God says, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. That is what the word says. That's the word of God. That's the word. So when I read that, it says, God is saying, Cindy, when you call on me, I'm going to answer. I'm going to be with you in your time of trouble. I'm going to be with you. And then I'm going to rescue you. Not only that, I'm going to honor you at the end. Boom, shakalaka laka, boom. That's what God is going to do. He's going to do that for you. He's going to do that for me. That is our promise. And it is in that that I am confident. It is not because I can earn it. And it's not because of how good I am. It's because how good he is. Is because I have relationship with that God. I am imperfect, but I have been living a life in pursuit of that perfect God. And every morning, I fail so many. I'm like every five minutes, you know what I'm saying? Okay, every three minutes, let's be honest. But I am pursuing Christ. 
but I know that we are in good relationship. James 5.16, let me help you with this. I'm telling you, this is giving me life. James 5.16 says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The, prayer, the prayers of a righteous person have power and produce powerful, wonderful results. That's where I'm living. I'm righteous. Now, it's not self-righteousness because, again, like I said, I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. I know that. But when I read that, I want to know, okay, I need my prayers answered. Anybody else? Anybody else needs wonderful results on their prayers? I mean, not just results, wonderful results. That's what the Bible says. Then we have to be righteous. So how do we become righteous? Let me know because I need to be righteous because I, right now in this storm, I need wonderful results. Well, the Bible has all the answers. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, to take all of our sins, all of the people that have lived, all of the people living, and all of the people that are about to come, and all their foolishness. God made Jesus sin. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, so that in him and through him, you and I can become the righteousness of God. So how do you and I become righteous? Through Jesus. How do you and I become righteous? Through salvation, at salvation. The moment that you and I receive Jesus at salvation, receive Jesus, and we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, and we take him in as our Lord. What does that mean? That we, God, lead my life. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to be imperfect because I'm human, but I'm going to do everything within my power my ability to follow you and follow your instructions for my life. When you do that, you are righteous. That's it. I am not righteous because I pray five hours a day. I don't. I'm not righteous because I fast every week. I am not righteous because I raise my hands while we worship. Now, I grow when I grow in Christ when I pray. Because you can't develop a relationship if you don't talk to the person. You and I, the more we talk to each other, the deeper our relationship goes. Because the more I learn about you, the more you learn about me. That's why we want you to come and volunteer at the Easter egg hunt. That's why we want you to come and be with us at the prayer walk the weekend before when we go inviting people in our neighborhood. You know why? Because as we do that, we get to know one another. And our relationship goes deeper. And we get more connected. The same way with God. When we pray, when we fast, when we read his word, we grow in God. But righteousness comes as salvation period there is no degrees of righteousness you will never be more righteous than you are the moment you got saved now religion has a hard time for that because religion wants us to work for things but you could never work enough to become righteous the moment you are saved you are righteous everybody say through Jesus, through Jesus. At, salvation. at salvation that's all it takes for you and I to be righteous so now that we understand that, that God will answer the prayers of a righteous person. And he says that every time we call upon him, he's going to show up. It is in that fact, it is in those facts, it is in that truth that I'm standing on and walking in confidence through this storm. It is in that truth that Doris is standing on and walking through this storm. It is in that truth that my family is, it is in that truth that you are rallying around us and praying and believing God for us through this storm. It is based on this truth. And that is available for you. And for all of us, if you are a Christ follower, if you believe that Jesus is who he said he was, you can expect wonderful results on your prayers. Period. You can expect God to answer. You can expect God to be there with you in your time of trouble. And you can expect wonderful results in all of your prayers. God bless you. Just in case you were missing Pastor Scott. That's the only foolishness I'm going to do this morning. That's it. I'm going to behave this morning. Now, so be praying for us. This is just my storm. But listen, 
My storm is not any different than your storm. There's people, this happens every day. People are going through stuff every day. Now, I have been through storms in my life that I was not so confident. There is two types of storms that come in our lives. There's the storms of life, like the one that I'm walking through right now. I, there's nothing I can do. I didn't cause it. It just came. The Bible says it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. The Bible says that trouble is going to come, but he's going to be there. The Bible says when trouble comes, not if it comes, when it comes, don't be afraid because I'm going to be with you. Right? So there's those storms, but then there's the other kind of storms that are the consequences of my decisions. The storms that I've caused. Anybody. In those storms, I'm not so confident. <laughs> because I know, in, regardless of what anybody says, I know I deserve this. Um, no, I, yeah, I did that. Mm. I did, and, and what you've heard has elements of, probably not everything you've heard is true, because usually the people that talk about anybody is the people that know, they know the least about that person in your life too? Like the people that talk about me is the people that know me the least. Like what are you talking about? Now, they probably have elements of truth. It's probably worse than what they're saying. So those things are true. In your life too? I'm just saying, I'm not going to look over here in the front row, but I'm going to stay focused. But in those storms that I have caused, I don't walk in such confidence because I know what I deserve. Now let me tell you something. I'm here with good gospel news for you. A storm is a storm. And God in his word didn't say, if, you, if your prayers are for something that, I, that you didn't do, I will answer. But if it's for something that you did, you're on your own. God didn't say that. God is very specific. He said when you call on him, he's going to answer. When you are in trouble, regardless if you caused it or not, he is going to be there. So I am here to tell you that regardless of whatever storm you're walking through, your God is stronger than the storm. I don't know what caused your storm. I don't know what type of storm you're walking through. For category five, a category three, a storm is a storm. God is with you and he's greater than the storm. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about a man in the Bible that knew exactly what to do and didn't do it. No, it's not you. Didn't find your story. And it's not me. Because my story is not in the Bible, thank God. It will be a long, 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 lots of chapters. I'm going to talk to you about Jonah. Jonah is a book of the Bible. It's a story. It's not a parable. It's not like a fable. It is a real story. You could go in the history books and you can go geography and you could go down the history. It happened. This is a story in the, in, and there's a book named Jonah. And it's only four chapters. If you are a slow reader like me, it will take you about 15 minutes to read it. If you're a fast reader like Pastor Scott, you can read it in five minutes. But this is a great story. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to paraphrase it. And as I do, I want to just drop in some nuggets that have encouraged me through this season of my life. Can I do that this morning? Yeah. All right. So Jonah, before we go there, because everybody's like, Jonah, which one is Jonah, Jonah, Jonah? Jonah is the guy that got swallowed by the whale. Okay, and we're going to get there eventually. We're going to backtrack, and I'm going to tell you the story. But let me just preface one thing. When I get excited, it's even harder to understand me. <laughs> I want you to know that I know. But we're in Florida. There has been a Latino uh, situated near you to help you translate whatever you don't understand. <laughs> You're welcome. For those of you watching online, You're on your own. No, just kidding. <laughs> just type it up, and I'm sure that the person communicating with you speaks Spanglish as well, because that's how Florida rolls. <laughs> But I can't say the word, okay, see how, what happened? I can't say the word well, very, the well, very well, unless I'm really thinking. And throughout, I might get excited, so I'm just going to say great big fish. <laughs> Is that good with y'all? Okay, so now you know. All right. So Jonah, okay, Jonah was a prophet. 
right? So God talked to Jonah and Jonah talked to the people because this is in the, in the first covenant. This is before Jesus. And that's how it worked. God talked to a man and the man relayed the news to the people. So this is not new. That's why jo Jonah was a prophet. He was a, 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 one of the children of Israel. And he was a man. And he was a prophet. And God talked to him and he talked to the people. So God told on this particular day, God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a city that it was very perverse. It was not, um, it was like a pagan, like, you know, they, they worship all the gods. There was a lot of perversion. It would be like the worst of Vegas mixed in with Mardi Gras, mixed in with like Gasparilla, mixed in, you know what I'm saying? Like they were not saying that any of those things are bad. Just giving you a picture of a place that was like out of control. And God wanted Jonah to go over there and speak to those people so they will know the truth and that God, Jehovah, is the true God. So they will change their ways and they could have a better life as they worship God. So Jonah decided to do the opposite. He decided to, he went to the pier, he got on a boat, but instead of going to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction. Don't judge him. Just like you and I. Just like you and I. God speaks to us and we do the opposite. So he got on a boat with a bunch of other people and he just like went about his business. Just totally blatant disobedience to God's word. And they get on the boat and they go into the sea and a great storm comes upon them. Jonah's disobedience created a storm in his life. The same way that when we disobey the word of God, a storm comes upon our life. God had a plan for Jonah. God's plan for Jonah was to go to Nineveh and speak to those people so they could be saved. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. According to Jeremiah 29, God had a plan before we were born. There was a deficit in the earth, and that's why you and I were created. I don't understand why God will use this Puerto Rican girl to speak when it is so hard to understand me. <laughs> maybe because you need to, maybe, I don't know, like work on your like, focus skills or something. You're welcome. <laughs> I am here to be a blessing. But God has a perfect plan for you and for me. And God has a perfect plan right here. How do I know the plan? Right here. Get in this book. Get in this book. God has a plan for your relationships. God has a plan for your money. God has a plan for your lifestyle. God has a plan for your parenting. God has a plan for everything in your life. God has a plan. And if you and I decide to disobey God's plan, guess what? We can expect a stormy season in our life. You don't have to be a weather person to know that. It is just the way that it is. So Jonah, his disobedience, they're in the middle of a storm. Well, people in the boat, they start throwing stuff out because, you know, there were big waves and they're trying to, like, the boat to get the wave and it's heavy. Let's don't throw it because people panic in a storm. Everybody panics. They start throwing their supplies. They start throwing their provision. They start throwing their equipment. Isn't it funny? When people get in a storm, we start throwing stuff away. We start throwing away our relationship with God. We start throwing away our attendance to church. We throw away our spouse. The devil is a liar. We start throwing away. We quit our jobs. We, we throw everything away except the right thing. We throw everything away except the right thing. So they came to Jonah and they, they woke him up because Jonah was asleep. Oh, yeah, he was. Sleeping in the storm. Things are going crazy People are trying to survive it. Let me tell you something. Let me do a sidebar here. I know that we always say, this is my life, and why do what is, it's going to affect me in my life. Your disobedience will cause a storm in, in the people's lives that, that are around you. Your disobedience will cause a storm in your family's life. Your disobedience will cause a storm in your job. Your disobedience will cause a storm in your circle of influence. Don't think it's only about you. The same way we affect people in the good, the enemy takes everything to pervert it. But I have great gospel, great gospel news for you. See? 
I just want to make sure you're paying attention because I want you to be encouraged. I got great news for you. God's grace is greater than the storm. Yes, it is. God, I know there's many people here that you feel there was a storm in my life that I didn't cause. And it was a consequence on somebody else's disobedience. Let me tell you something. God's grace is bigger than that storm. And like for these people in the boat, they didn't cause the storm. It was Jonah's disobedience. Jonah took on responsibility and he said, throw me overboard. If you throw me overboard, the storm will cease. And they struggled with that. Obviously, they were not, you know, they were not God followers. The Bible specifically says that they, they worship all the gods because they had already been praying to their gods and everything. Nothing happened. Nothing happened because those other gods have no power. So nothing happened. So Jonah said, no, seriously, throw me overboard and the storm will cease. Guess what? Picked him up. See ya. <laughs> they threw him overboard. So here's Jonah, totally taking matters into his own hands and decided to live his life opposite of what God had required of him. With really, God didn't require something that he could not do. This is what Jonah did. He went around and he spoke to people about God. That was what he did. That's what he, what he, that's what he daddy did. He did it too. He, that's what he's always done. But he just, that day, he just woke up with it. Underwear is in the wad. I was going to say panties, but surely he didn't wear panties. But he wore underwear because remember the, the Levi? Again, you have to go to last week's message. Little plug for our website, freelachapel.org. Jonah found himself in disobedience in the middle of the storm. So now they threw him overboard. The moment they threw him overboard, the, stop, the storm ceased. Stop. Done. Jonah took responsibility, which is awesome, because he could have been like, yeah, I don't know what's happening. This storm is bad. I guess somebody didn't check the weather, and he could have let them throw stuff. It was great that Jonah took responsibility and said, no, I'm causing the storm. He knew the same way you and I know when we're walking in disobedience. I know, too close to home. Okay, I'll move on. So, again, about Jonah. Jonah found himself, Jonah found himself overboard, and drowning because of disobedience. You see, it is awesome that he took responsibility, but that is not the end of the story because here came the sea of consequences. See, he took, he took responsibility and admitted it. They threw him overboard. They, the storm stopped for the people on the boat, but now Jonah is drowning in a sea of consequences. And in that moment, knowing that he was guilty, knowing that he deserved to die, knowing that everything that was happening, he had come because he knew better. And that moment, knowing all those things, he also remembered that he knew that that God that he served imperfectly, but he served him, was a gracious God. He also knew that that God that he served imperfectly was a compassionate God. He also remembered that that God was slow to anger. He remembered that that God loves with an unconditional love. He remembered that that God is a God of covenant. That he said, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Jonah cried out to the Lord. And this is something that you and I need to learn from Jonah. In the moment of trouble, regardless of how guilty you and I feel, regardless of all the consequences around it and how we are drowning and we can't come up for air, at that moment we need to cry out to the Lord. You know why? Because God will always bring salvation. God will always, always bring salvation. God, we read it at the beginning. He said he will always answer us. He will be there with us in trouble. Remember Psalms 91? He will be there with us. But isn't it funny? The last thing you want to do when you are drowning in the sea of consequences is to cry out to God. Because you think, I don't have the right. And this is what I'm coming to tell you in that moment. I need you to have confidence. 
I need you to have confidence, not in yourself and your ability to do the right thing at the right time. I need you to have confidence that God is who he says he is and that his word is true and will not return void. Cry out to the Lord. And when Jonah cried out to the Lord, God sent salvation because I told you, God will always bring salvation. So here's where the big great fish comes in. And the fish swallowed him. Now, probably not the way that Jonah expected God to respond. Jonah probably expected the Coast Guard to come in, you know, helicopter, you know, like, you know, come down in a cable and hook him up and take him back or maybe a boat. I mean, like, he probably would have, you know, he probably would have been okay with a noodle. You know what I'm saying? Give me some. No, no, no noodle, no none of that. A big fish swallowed him. Have God ever answered you in the way that you did not expect? This is what I was talking about. Sometimes you got to go hiking. Sometimes the, the mountain is not going to move. But don't be dismayed because you are prepared. You are equipped. Holy Spirit, a fabulous guy. And when you get to the top, I hear that's why people love the mountaintop experience because it's like none other. But we want the mountaintop experience without the hiking. You can't get to the top without hiking. God sent a fish, and the fish swallowed Noah. Uh, Noah. Not Noah, but Jonah. Are y'all paying attention? <laughs> I'm not going to go Medea on you, all right? <laughs> Jonah. We're talking about Jonah. Ezra, Ezra 9a. It's a passage of Scripture, and it says, God will give us a little space of grace. See, in the sea of consequences, God swallowed Jonah in a space of grace. Because the, the big fish may not be like a great idea for you and I, but when you consider the circumstances of the ocean, he was in the middle of the ocean, seaweed, all kinds of stuff, sharks, all kinds of stuff, octopus, you know, like the spiky little thing, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. God, it was the sea, Pastor Rick. <laughs> Have you not seen Little Mermaid? <laughs> when the fish swallowed him, the Bible says that God will provide for you and I a space of grace. When the fish swallowed Jonah, he was saved. It was unconventional, but he, God kept Jonah saved. And God will always provide for you and I a place in the storm that is calm, a space of grace. Now, it didn't fit, the, the story is not over for Jonah the same way the story is not over for me, or the same way that it, the story is not over for you because we have a wonderful service today and we have powerful worship and we are inspired and we are encouraged. When you go out these doors, the, the storm is still there. But I want you to know that you have been swallowed up in a space of grace that God has provided for you that is greater than any storm. It may, the fish may have swallowed you, but it hasn't destroyed you. The situation may have you swallowed right now, but it hasn't destroyed you. Have you ever survived something that you thought you could never survive? Me too. Me too. And I... And I survived it, not because I'm so strong. You know, I had somebody that said something to me the, this week. It's like, you are so strong. I'm not that strong. Nobody's as strong as you think they are. Let me, let me just make it simple. I am really not strong at all. I am not that strong. I am not that connected. Really. I'm not that popular. Shocker. Really, I'm not. I have just been swallowed up in a space of grace in this season of my life. The same space of grace that is available for you. God is not respecter of person. After three days in the belly of the fish, Jonah was there. When you read the story, really, the three days that he was there, Jonah was very grateful. He was praying this whole time. He was praying, and he was grateful prayers. He it was prayers of gratitude. 
Because there's something that happens to you and I when we're isolated in our lowest point. Something about human, humanity, when we are all alone at our lowest point, we look up to God. And you know what? That offends religion, but that doesn't offend God. God knows that's the way we roll. God knows. He, he's not disappointed in us. He's waiting for us. The moment that Jonah decided to walk away from the will of God, the plan of God, and he went that way, and he was walking this way, away from the plan of God, God's what, God was with him the whole time. He, but God is a gentleman. He's not going to relationship. It's gentle. Relationship invites. If you're in a relationship that is falseful and people jump on you, that's not healthy. Get out. God was waiting for Jonah to cry out to him. God was waiting to hear Jonah reflect. And after three days of reflection, the whale spit him out on the beach. People always say it could, it could not get worse. It could always get worse. He could have come out the other end. It could always be worse. Just when you're thinking, just think of Jonah. See, God can do such a work in us when we reflect on him and we humble ourselves. That that issue that has you trapped, that you can't get out, that issue, God will make you allergic to that issue. And he will have to spit you out. Won't you love to give the enemy a bad taste in his mouth? Won't you love to be the cause of the enemy to walk around with bad breath? Like worse than what it is? Like no listering? God could do that kind of a work for us, that that issue that has us hold, hold back, held back, will spit us out. See, but this is one thing that I want you to hear as we close with Jonah. He didn't take a victim mentality. Victim mentality is deadly. He took on responsibility. He owned it and he repented. If you take a victim, if you and I take a victim mentality, we won't own it. We won't repent. If we don't repent, we don't change our ways. Jonah was going this way. He needed to take responsibility. He needed to own it so he can repent and change his way and go back and follow the plan of God for his life. That is the same process you and I have to go through. We have to own it. Take responsibility. Repent which means change your way and set you back in course. No victim mentality. Jonah got sped out with a new mind. See, Jonah went to Nineveh after he got sped out. Jonah went to Nineveh. 120,000 people decided to follow God and change. 120,000 people. I want you to stand to your feet. Think about it. 120,000 people. That was the plan. That victory was what God had for Jonah all along. God never gave up on Jonah. God could have used anybody else. God could have used another prophet. God could have used another man. God could have used another woman. But God didn't give up on Jonah. God stayed with Jonah. You know why? Because God is not, not going he's not gonna give up on you. God wants you to know he's not gonna, even if you disobey. Blake, Jonah knew better. He was a prophet. He knew better. And God didn't give up on him. God is not going to give up on you. And I know many people right now might not hear, but if, as they hear this outside of this church, might think, well, you know, because, you know, religion is always concerned that somebody's going to abuse God's grace. Let me tell you something. He's God. Ain't nobody abusing God. God has never been in an abusive relationship. You know what I'm saying? We, I don't have to regulate or legislate God's grace. God's grace is available for you regardless of your storm, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your consequences. God's grace is there. Jonah ended up doing exactly what God wanted him to do. God's plan is a good plan for your life. God is not going to change his mind about you. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to take responsibility. It doesn't matter how long it takes me to cry unto the Lord. It doesn't matter how long it takes us to change our ways. God is there, ready to answer our cry, ready to answer, to give us wonderful results for our prayers. I don't know what kind of storm you're finding yourself this morning. I don't know if it's a life 
storm or, or a storm of consequences. But regardless of your storm, I'm here to tell you a simple truth, that your God is greater than the storm, that God's grace is greater than any consequence that you find yourself in. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, God, that you speak to us exactly where we are. And Father, this morning, we take responsibility. Father, we don't want to have a victim mentality because whatever it is, we don't want to yell at the waves of consequences. We want to own it. We want to change our ways, God, so the storm can cease. Father, help us not to throw whatever is valuable overboard. Father, let us hold on to our relationship with you and the right relationships that you have brought into our life to encourage us and to walk this walk with us. Father, we cry out to you in the middle of this sea. We cry out to you knowing that you are good, knowing that you have saved us before and you will do it again. You will never get tired of saving us, God. I am grateful, God, that you have rescued me before and you're going to do it again. God, we are living a life of pursuit, not perfect, but in perfect pursuit of your son, Jesus Christ. This pursuit, God, I know is going to produce a confidence in us, not because in who we are, but because of who you are in us. Because greater is he that is in us than everything else that is outside. We thank you for your word. And Father, we go forth this morning knowing that you are greater than this storm. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Can you put your hands together? Amen, amen.